Okay, thank you very much for having me. I'm Steve Reiner at uh, D-Wave Systems. Um, in some ways, I, I think of my career as having focused on delivering kind of wacky new hardware from the lab into a, a mode that is routinely usable, delivering high performance. Sometimes I've done that as an individual contributor, uh, developing kernel support for parallelism, uh, de delivering um, kernel, um, graph algorithms in uh, uh, the Eureka Sparkle product from uh, Cray Inc. Sometimes I've done that in a project leadership role, uh, Cray T3D and T3E, delivering distributed memory, um, distributed shared memory in Altix and Altix UV, uh, and in, in uh, making our current uh, D-Waves systems, which have their extraordinary uh, processor architecture. So when I, when I think about this, I, uh, I, I look at this from a technology point of view, and I always also think about this from a project point of view. How, how am I going to uh, work through new technology and make, some, make sure that I come out the other end with something I actually like and, 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 and is useful? Um, so when I, when I, whenever I present to uh, an organization or a, an audience, I always stop and think, okay, so what do I know that they care about? Um, and especially I, I think of this audience as being very much focused, uh, people who deploy computer systems. And uh, you very much like to know the details, you like to know what's inside them, but you really need to deploy them because that's what your organizations count on you to do. And so I, I'm, I'm gonna try to structure this uh, in that way. And as I looked at the agenda, uh, I, I saw the, uh, the leading lights of, of quantum computing, myself accepted, um, and I thought, what am I gonna say that's, that's relevant? I, I'm not a quantum physicist, uh, and I'm not today and won't be in the near future. And I, I realized that maybe it just comes down to, I'm probably giving a different kind of presentation than the technologist. Um, you know, our, our systems are at different points of maturity, and so for systems that are a little more distant, uh, focusing on the technology and the technology issues is important. Um, for our systems, which are nearer term, uh, it's, it's important to balance the technology with the project uh, aspects of the system. So that, that's, I'm, I'm, you'll hear me flip back and forth, and I'll try to be uh, explicit about, about when I'm flipping, but uh, alas. So uh, I picked a title when I was on an airplane yesterday. It's every bit as good as you'd expect. Um, and my point is that I, I think it's a difficult time right now um, in that for, for people in your position of when do I want to adopt? Well, it's not at all obvious because A, the technology is pretty raw today, but the, the improvement the, the improvement slope is amazing. So it, it's a difficult choice. So the message I wanted to bring today is that computationally differentiated organizations should now be finding appropriate high value apps and mapping them to D-Wave systems for possible compelling performance advantage in two years. So let me un unpack a few phrases out. So computationally differentiated organizations, if your organization thinks that your advantage versus your competition is the fact that you compute better, that's what I'm talking about. Finding appropriate high value applications, is that vague enough for you? Uh, appropriate here means things that are likely to get benefit from our style of processor. That's a little fuzzy. Um, we don't understand that completely. No one else does either. Um, high value apps, you're going to want to choose something high value because this is not easy to do today. Uh, it takes quite a bit of thought. Um, and mapping them to our systems uh, is, I hope that's obvious. So I wanted to cover these things, uh, identifying uh, near-term technology, uh, deliver, how, how we expect ourselves to deliver differentiated performance, um, adopting quantum annealing technology in a rational way, and then navigating by some of the uh, early application successes we've seen to date. So jumping into the technology, uh, I'll, I'll do this very quickly. So 
Uh, you've heard a, a couple uh, descriptions that were more thorough than I'm attempting to give here uh, about gate model architectures, uh, first described by David Deutsch in 1985. At, um, the significant theoretical work continues. Uh, algorithms defined in the 90s, uh, Peter Shore's integer factorization. Uh, the major issue of error correction was identified by uh, John Preskill in 98. Um, and people talked about this. I, I, I think one thing we should call out is that one of the apparent advantages of, of the topological approach being pursued by Microsoft is that it, I, I believe, uh, avoids this issue. So that, that's a significant uh, win for it. Uh, the first quantum algorithm was demoed on physical qubits in 98. Uh, you, you heard John Martinez talk about uh, their, their system now with 72 physical qubits. And it seems as though the, this, the, the digital nature of the processor is, is, has become a little fuzzy here recently. Uh, it, several people have already talk, talked about the NISC term that's coming into vogue. Our systems, by contrast, uh, are quite different. Uh, I, I refer to them here as a quantum annealing architecture. Um, Nishimori and, and Fari both uh, described attributes of this in the late 90s. Uh, Jordi Rose, who was one of uh, D-Wave's founders, uh, identified a path to building such systems in 2004. Uh, since then, starting in 2010, we've delivered four generations of systems, uh, the latest of which has 2,000 qubits. What we see there is that problems that are friendly to the D-Wave topology, uh, some problems, show a 1,000x performance advantage. That's a nice thing. In practice, real-world problems, I think of it as rough parity. If, if, if we do our job very well, we're at rough parity. New system generations coming out about every two years, roughly doubling the number of qubits. So this is a significant uh, pace we're on here. And so we think we're getting close to the point where people like you who deploy computer systems and, and need to do it well and effectively, uh, that, that this is approaching the point at which this is relevant for you. Um, and it's not just us. So this slide is from Eulish, uh, who uh, many of you will know as one of the leading HPC labs in Europe. Uh, they've recently defined this uh, quantum technology readiness levels, uh, describing the maturity. It's, it's kind of a log scale. You can read this as well as I can. Um, what they've done is you see the experimental devices down here at uh, levels three and four, IBM Google systems here at, at QDRL, QTRL5, and the D-Wave systems up here at, uh, at level eight, showing a scalable version, completed and qualified in test. And the thing that's uh, missing is to show, in my terms, differentiated performance. So let's move to that. So I'm gonna take a slight detour here just to quickly call out the uh, the, the programming model and the underlying uh, what we call a quantum machine instruction or QMI. So you've already heard about qubits. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. You've already heard about qubits, uh, these things that exist in, um, in, can exist in superposition. At the end of an annealing cycle, uh, they settle into one of two possible final states. Uh, we, we represent this as more the computer science thing where the final states are zero and one. Uh, we have couplers that uh, allow uh, a pair of qubits to influence each other. And then the, we have weights on the, uh, on the qubits and strengths on the couplers. And those are the things that a, a, a programmer, may, dare I say a heroic programmer, um, or maybe um, more practically a, a, a tool on behalf of a programmer, will set those weights to um, to go into this uh, objective function represented here. So the Q sub i's are just binary things, so those are the zeros or the ones, and then they preserve the A sub i's and the B sub i j's where uh, either a, a single Q sub i is a one or a pair of Q sub i's are both ones. So you, 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 gotta, you can think of it as kind of, uh, as a simple matrix operation. And so, Effectively, you're specifying an energy landscape with, uh, with, with, with this approach. Uh, if it doesn't feel natural, you're not the only one that it doesn't feel natural for. This, this takes quite a bit of, um, 
of, of use to, to gain intuition about. Um, but, the, the, but it allows you to do that. It allows you to create an energy landscape. Uh, and then, as, as has been, come up in some of the other talks, um, you're effectively sampling from this, energy, from this uh, probability distribution represented uh, by, this, um, by this representation. And so we, we refer to this as a quadratic, uh, un unconstrained binary optimization problem. Uh, quadratic meaning the interactions are pairwise. They're, they're not three things interacting. They're not six things interacting. They're two things interacting. Um, binary, the results are zeros or ones. Um, so you, you'll hear this term cubo from us a lot. Uh, physicists refer to this as, as an icing model or an easing model, uh, depending on uh, what country you're from. Um, operations research people to this refer to this as an unconstrained binary quadratic problem. There are other terms in other fields. It's the same underlying math. So with that sampling, uh, with the energy landscape and the sampling, one thing that we have learned that our processor is very good at is giving you a comprehensive view of the valleys in your energy landscape. Not necessarily the lowest point in each valley, but where are the valleys? And so this, this plot here, I, I want to explain. So on, on the x-axis here, we have cumulative time, a uh, log scale, uh, cumulative annealing time. So that's effectively time using our processor. Um, on the, the y-axis, we have the fraction of valley seen. And, what you, and the, the plots here are, there's, for each color, there are three. The middle one is, uh, sorry, I left out one thing. So for, we created a, a set of problems. Uh, and we ran that set of problems uh, with multiple solvers. And the middle line is the mean of, of, of that, those, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was 100 distinct problems. And then you have the uh, 25th percent, percentile and the 75th percentile. So you can see here that the, the D-Wave system is finding uh, all the valleys in something between 10 to, about the midpoint of 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth. The best classical is out here at something between 10 to the seventh and 10 to the eighth. So if we're just talking orders of magnitude, this is roughly 10 to the third uh, times faster than the best classical solver. So notice I used some caveats there. I said for problems structured to the D-wave topology, that's a, that's a important caveat, um, that we're able to deliver performance that's a thousand times better, order of a thousand times better than the best classical processor. So that, that's a big thing. So if you think about it, um, the Cray-1 was probably 10 to 100 times. Uh, I, I worked on the Cray-T3E systems at Cray Research. Um, I think we were probably really happy when we delivered a hundred times performance. We didn't always get there. Uh, this is a thousand x. That's a big number, and for real-world problems, we lose quite a bit of efficiency. So we have work to do. So, so stepping back for a moment, and and perhaps just to state the obvious, um, any quantum performance advantage will be delivered only from problems or subproblems that fit on our quantum processing unit. Uh, don't think that, that that means that any problem you solve has to, has to fit on the, on the QPU because we have a decomposing solver that split big problems into small problems, small problems that will fit on the, on the quantum processing unit. But what I want to do now is focus on how those QPU size problems grow. So today, uh, our system, uh, D-Wave 2000Q, 2000 qubits, in practice, problems of about 64 variables fit on the QPU. So we've already talked publicly about a next generation system targeted at four to 5,000 qubits with a substantially denser topology. So if this, how does this 64 variables grow on our next generation system? So we have more qubits. The change there is expected to be two to two and a half X. So 
the effect on the number of variables in the QMI is about mu multiplied by 1.4 to 1.6. We have a denser topology, uh, two and a half times denser. That increases the number of variables in the QMI by about a factor of 2.8. Um, over the last several generations, we've seen that changes to our annealing processor, uh, to the annealing cycle and controls on the annealing cycle have con contributed greatly to better performance of our processors. Uh, there's nothing we're, we're prepared to, uh, I have an example here that there was um, using per qubit advance and delay within the annealing cycle uh, gave a, a, a 1,000x for some use cases, a 1,000x performance increase. Um, but there's nothing we're prepared to divulge about this, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming no benefit from that. And then in, in other algorithms and tools, uh, we, we have a better uh, embedding algorithm, uh, which will increase, our, the, the, increase the number of variables in the QMI by roughly 1.3. So if you take all these together, that says you're, you're at a factor of about 5.4. Four six or maybe something like 326 variables. So what this means is that the, the size of the problem that, that we solve natively uh, is, is getting substantially larger. Well, who does this matter for? Well, actually, there were a couple comments uh, earlier about 2 to the 300th being you know, the size of the universe and all that. Um, and, and, of, and of course, as was pointed out there, uh, we, n none of our quantum processors scale uh, with that idealistic view. What we have is, um, we, so, but we do want to talk about where are, are there problems that are classically tractable at their current size that will be classically intractable at 326 variables. And an example of those, working with one collaborator is Markov networks, where the problems they're able to solve today are about 50 variables. and. Uh, the numbers in the hundreds are intractable, so 326 sounds like a major win for them. So this is about delivering differentiated performance. Of course, I, d I don't want to make it seem like we just write some numbers on a slide and, and we have all that done, because that's shockingly re uh, unrealistic. Um, so there are challenges here. Increasing the number of connections per qubit by 2.5x is a major change to the qubit itself. Uh, the qubit has to be much, much better. Um, getting a higher fraction of the results valid uh, in, in, requires a number of things, in, in, including reducing a significant, uh, an important source of noise. Something we've realized from our processors is that the multi-qubit tunneling is the essence of the value we get out of it. So this is kind of, if you could think of it in Hamming distance between, uh, in a space, um, we get much more value from, th that's the primary source of the value of our processor. Uh, so we have some things we want to do to make that, uh, that tunneling more effective. And last, uh, we've recently introduced some, some uh, better controls, more precise controls on the annealing cycle, and we have things to, to understand how best to use those. Okay, so if you're a, um, so if I put, put my, uh, my project manager hat on and I'm in, in responsible for technology adoption at, at a major organization, so how do I think about adopting this in, in, in a reasonable way? Um, so I think about probabilities uh, in maybe an odd way. Um, so I, I think of them as, um, just in orders of magnitude, and, and only half orders of magnitude matter. So, uh, you know, if, if we think of, of zero to 100% here, 1% and 3%, um, you know, and I think about technology adopt, adoption. Um, if something is that likely, do you really spend that much time thinking about it? Probably not. You, you don't want to be oblivious to it, but you don't want to spend that much time. Um, at 10%, uh, you better be thinking about this. You know, you, 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 you're not spending a ton of time on it, but you, but you need to be monitoring it. At 33%, uh, you need to be really pretty seriously prepared. Um, you want to understand the technology in depth, 
And if it were me, I'd want to have hands-on experience with, with likely first uses. So on that, uh, and when I go to the, the top half of this, you know, 50 to, the, the 50 to 100% range, I just kind of flip the, the, the probabilities. I don't, I don't continue to go logarithmically. I just, and so at, at two thirds, at 67%, um, you really should, you know, for me, I want to know that I'm pretty fluent uh, in, in the technology or, or appropriate people in the organization and, and have a first use case that is readily deployable. At 90%, um, probably want to be ready to, to deploy with multiple use cases. And at 99 or 97, you, you want to disseminate to other parts of the organization so they can get the third and fourth and nth use cases using. So this is the way I think of this. Uh, my, I, my personal opinion is that our systems are at the, at, at the 33% order of magnitude uh, for likelihood of uh, delivering differentiated performance for, uh, from this next generation system. I could be wrong. It could be less than that. I, I don't think it's 1%. Could well be 10%. I don't think it's 67%. But that, that, that's my personal belief. So how might you integrate uh, D-Wave execution? Um, Become familiar with the Cubo, Cubo formulation. It's a big deal. It's, it's hard to uh, overstate how important that is, how different that is for most HPC people. Uh, find problems that plausibly benefit. Uh, discrete optimization, well representable as Cubo. Uh, not tiny, but not bi big enough to be classically demanding, but not too big. Um, and then formulate the problem for D-Wave and then assess performance. So, and last, I wanna call out, I, I think we should guide ourselves by some early application successes. So this is VW at last year's CBIT. Uh, they wanted to uh, start with a real world problem. And so they picked uh, open source data that showed um, traffic, uh, t taxi data from Beijing, and we ultimately, picked uh, 418 cars going from the city center to the airport. Uh, we wanted to assign each taxi to a route such that each route is minimally overlaps with other cars to res resolve congestion. Uh, here's the before picture. There's the after picture. You can see congestion was resolved. They viewed this as a, as a major win. Next one is uh, from the election we had here recently in the US. Some of you may have uh, missed that somehow. Um, but the, the, the key point is that how, it's astonishing how bad the predictions were. They gave, they gave Trump, like, you can see, you know, one or two percent chance of winning. Obviously, that's wrong. As it turns out, if you look at that uh, more closely, you get a better model. Uh, an example of that is uh, that, that there are actually correlations between the states, where all the models said the states are independent. Well, why did we believe that? Um, so they were able to get much better... Uh, models out of this. Last, I'll just mention one in, a, in an area that you might never think of, and that is uh, sh selling us all ads on our smartphones. Um, the, our uh, uh, Recruit Communications, a large company doing this, uh, they chose uh, an algorithm with uh, the greedy algorithm they'd always used. They got about the same results, but they found that, A, there was lo less, much less volatility Sorry, this, this slide is click-through rate. They got much less um, volatility here with this new algorithm. And they also found that they were able to pace their budget more over a whole period rather than spending all their money at the, at the, at the beginning of a period. So they, they saw this as, as a significant win. And, and really, they're just able to include new constraints that they haven't been able to in the past. So I'll uh, end where I started here. That Organizations that view themselves as differentiating majorly on, on computation uh, should now be finding appropriate high-value apps and mapping them to D-Wave systems for this the possible compelling performance ad advantage of our next generation system. Thank you.